So I want to introduce Clay Eels. And hang on. Hold your applause. I know. Uh, Clay is a local West Seattle historian. He told me that I may or may not say that he actually grew up on Mercer Island. <laughs> what? We allowed him in this morning anyway. See, he, I made him drop his. Thanks. Sorry, Clay. Uh, so Clay worked at the West Seattle Historical Society. He also works with Paul Dorpat, who is a very famous West or Seattle historian who does the Now and Then column in the Sunday Times. And they have a new book called Seattle Now and Then, which is the best 100 columns from or episodes of that column out of 1800 or. Is that right? 1800? They pulled the best 100 out and they have a new book out. So he's going to be talking about that. He's also going to talk a little bit about West Seattle specifically, which is great. Um, and he has copies of the book for sale available over there. So please feel free to stop by and ask him some questions and we're going to let him set up his show and take us away a little bit. So thank you so much again for being here. I'll try not to grab the microphone again, and we'll just kind of turn it over to the program. But I hope that you guys have a great rest of your day. I hope that you support Rotary and Rotary programs, and I hope to see you all back here as our guests if you're not already Rotarians. Thank you. Clay. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, this is an incredible room. I mean, look around you. This is the who's who of West Seattle right here. It seems to me um, I'm honored to be a part of it. And uh, Rotary, I mean, how many of you here remember when Rotary took the kids out for shopping down at Sears? All right, all right. That is one of the now and thens in the book. It's not in the show today, but that's in the book is the Sears Tower, which is now what? Starbucks. Starbucks, absolutely. Well, um, this talk today is really focused on the book, um, and I am so honored to have been a part of this book. I've known Paul, oh gosh, it goes back uh, 35 years or more. In fact, how many of you remember this publication? Um, you know, I still call it the New Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> it opened in 1984, and I was fortunate to be the editor of the West Seattle Herald and White Center News back in the 80s when the bridge was being built and then opened. And we put together a 104-page special section called Bridging the Gap. This was a big deal for us, a newspaper, a weekly paper. And this sort of led us to go even more crazy by uh, three years later putting out this. How many of you know this book? West Side Story. We did that in a year. It's the most exhausting, exhilarating year of my life. Anyway, back in the early 80s, um, we were looking to document the history of transportation in West Seattle uh, because of the bridge. And uh, one of the key parts of that was the fact that we had the first ferry boat on the Sound. And so uh, I wanted to have a photo of it in, in West Side Story. And I went over to Paul's house. Paul, you all know from the Sunday Times Now and Then column, he had just started it in January of 1982. And I went over to his house, and it's an experience, anybody who's been there, to go down into his basement, and stuff is all over the place, and he's pulling out drawers. And he, this is the first time he met me, and I met him. And he pulls out a two and a quarter by two and a quarter negative of this image with a little tear in the top of it and it's a negative from 1890. And he says, here. You know, how many people do that? And he said, just get it back when you're done. I mean, the, the bond was sealed right there, and we've helped each other out over the years. Um, I've known him since then, and then um, his partner, Gene Sherrard, his work partner, um, has been shooting the now photos for Paul. You've probably noticed in the paper for the last uh, uh, 12 to 13 years. And they're in color now in the paper. It's just so great to see it in print that way. And they're also online. So I've worked with Gene for that long as well as Paul. And so we three are kind of attached at the hip because this, uh, this guy, this is, uh, this is a very young Paul Dorpat. You're gonna see some very, very uh, uh, 
uh, rare photos. This is Paul back in 1944, and he calls this photo saving the world for democracy. <laughs> He's grown up in North Dakota, and then he went to uh, Spokane, and uh, he had four brothers. This is Paul and his four brothers, um, and he's the youngest one. And then to come a little more recently, 10 years ago, Gene shot a photo of him and his brothers, and Paul's over on the right. Paul's the only one left. He's the youngest. And uh, Paul truly, to me, is a legend. Um, I think it's, it's incontrovertible that there is nobody in Seattle who's been more responsible for promoting history and a feeling of heritage in Seattle than Paul. I mean, think about it. The, the idea of, of shooting a photo, and taking, finding an old photo, and then shooting a photo from the same vantage point, that's not a new concept. People have been doing that for ages. But to do it for 37 years, every single week, 1,800 columns, this is unique. This is a treasure. Now, this is Paul with his mom and dad. His dad was a preacher. Mom was a social service activist. And then uh, Paul got his grounding here in Seattle once he got here and figured out a little bit more what he wanted to do. Does any of you remember the Helix? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is the underground paper at the University of Washington. <laughs> Ran for several years and uh, quite controversial at the time. And then, and I'm sorry this is, the image is cut off top and bottom, but you get the gist of it. Um, he also put, put together the first outdoor rock festival a year before Woodstock. This is the um, Sky River, up, up Highway 2 in Sultan. Sky River Rock Fest Festival and Lighter Than Air Fair. <laughs> and I don't know if you can see some of the names on here. Santana, Richard Pryor. I mean, this was a uh, very uh, high-level um, concert promotion. And this is Paul walking around in his saffron robe with... Uh, how many of you know Tom Robbins, the author, the famous author? This is the crowd Paul ran in. And then, of course, it had to rain. It was a rock festival. <laughs> So this is the roots of Paul Dorpat. <laughs> now, a little bit later, 1981, uh, is there anybody in this room that has this booklet? This is called 294 Glimpses of Historic Seattle. And this was produced for the Mayor's Small Business Task Force. And it sold 40,000 copies. It's a collection of old photos. And uh, this is really what Paul gave Paul his grounding and, and to start the column that we all know so well, called Now and Then. Um, and so uh, he mixed with some of the area's most famous historians, and I, I hear a lot of silence here, so you probably don't know, this is Murray Morgan, the author of Skid Road, which is uh, sort of the, 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 if you're gonna read one history of Seattle, that's it. Um, oh, by the way, Paul was on the left. <laughs> this is uh, Paul uh, interviewing a woman named Lucy Campbell Coe, and you don't know her name, I'm sure, but she has the distinction at the time uh, of having survived the great Seattle fire of 1889. She was well into her 90s, um, and Paul ended up interviewing four survivors of the, of the fire. Um, now we go to, fast forward to about eight years from now, uh, before now, in 2011, the old Mohai. How many of you went to the old Mohai out on Motley? Well, this was their very last exhibit called Now and Then, and Paul and Jean had come out with a Washington Then and Now book about photos going back and forth all over the state, and in conjunction with that, they did an exhibit at Mohai. Now, we're going to get to the present moment here. This is the cover of the book, for which I have copies over here. And by the way, I have nine copies that are already pre-signed by Paul and Jean. So just keep that in mind after you go, or before you go, after the breakfast and before you go. This is something that, you know, you, some of you may have some of Paul's books from the 1980s, the compilations. This is not a compilation. This is the best of. We call it the historic hundred. One hundred out of, uh, out of um, 1,800 columns. And it's a very subjective way of choosing. Um, this is uh, the look to downtown Seattle on the left from 
uh, Queen Anne Hill looking south in 1930, and on the right is uh, from last June. And in the book, this is a four-page panorama that is four feet wide. Uh, it's a fold-out, so it's kind of an impressive thing. Now, we went in order of the columns that, uh, as they appeared in the paper. And so this is the first then, January 17, 1982, and this is a homecoming parade for the Seattle's 63rd Coast Artillery. And if you're wondering where this is, this is Westlake Mall, looking north. And as a reference point, Gene's now photo is in January of 2017, the largest march in Seattle history, the Women's March, shortly after the inauguration. Um, and by the way, I should, uh, I should mention every photo in the book that's a then photo, think, think about the fact past 37 years, when Paul shot a now photo, well, it's a then now. <laughs> so we had to update all of these in beautiful color, and so that's the format here, and so you'll see a typical, oh, I want to show you, this is the original now of this then, and he got a barista down in the lower right corner to hold the original then, and there were even baristas in 1982, and uh, so this is the now close to today, a couple of years ago. And then this is how it looks in the book. There are three elements on every spread. There's a then, there's a now, and text. The text is cut down to about half of what it was from the column because we wanted to make sure to emphasize the photos, make them as big as possible for this copy table book. I'm going to run through these very quickly because we don't have much time. Um, but. The, the key here is to keep your eye on the slides because there's some really cool ones. This is Seattle's biggest snow. Uh, anybody hazard a guess as to when this might be? This is 1880. And uh, the day before this snow started falling, this, uh, Governor Elisha Ferry, he issued his State of the Territory report. We didn't become a state until nine years later. And he said, the, the weather in Seattle is very clement. Rarely do we have snow. Boom, the next day, for the next few days, we got 64 inches of snow. Now, imagine uh, Jean Sherrard's uh, challenge here in shooting a now photo um, at the same viewpoint downtown. Uh, you know, they clear the streets downtown very quickly. And so this is his now, to repeat the then, and Gene is very, very proud of the fact of that big stack of snow on the fire hydrant that you see down yeah. in the lower left. <laughs> uh, here is an, a waterfront photo by Anders Vilsa, a famous Norwegian photographer. This is taken in the late 1890s, and you see the ice plant uh, in the middle. This uh, was built shortly after the Great Fire the year before. And here's the waterfront today. And, you know, this is a now, but it's a then. We gotta update this. What's, what, what's changed in this photo? Huh? I think we all know that in West Seattle. Okay, um, you know, the two biggest events in Seattle's history in the early days were the Great Fire of 1889, but then also, eight years later, uh, the Gold Rush. You know, some of you may have seen replicas of the PI that said gold, 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 gold. Um, well, this is the waterfront scene just a year or so after the gold rush. This is Railroad Avenue, which is now Alaskan Way, and it's looking north, appropriately. And the key, you can't quite see it, but up in the upper left, there's a sign, and it's advertising. Imagine these guys going up to Alaska and the Yukon, and what are they going to carry with them? The sign says, Portable Aluminum Homes. Yes. <laughs> Portable <laughs> Aluminum Homes. Frost and fireproof, just the thing for Alaska. Weight, 150 pounds. So if you've seen Charlie Chaplin's The Gold Rush and them going, showing them going over Chilkoot Pass, imagine them carrying a portable home. Now, this is the, this is the now. Some of these nows are what we call ironic shots. This isn't a, quite a beautiful shot, but this is exactly from the same viewpoint of where this was taken. And Paul likes to talk about how the now and then feature is like playing hide and seek. People love to go back and forth and say, what was there, what isn't there, where are we, where are we now? It's like a little childhood game. 
And the next one really is a treat because this, we all know, well, I shouldn't say we all, many of us know that for many decades, when I grew up, it was this way before the World's Fair, the Smith Tower was the largest, tallest building west of the Mississippi, right? Well, this is uh, before the Smith Tower opened, about a year, and the Smith Tower is about 42 stories, but this is from the 35th floor when the cladding hadn't gone on to the Smith Tower. And this view, nobody in Seattle had seen before. The Webster and Stevens photographer got up there. And I want you to take a look. Um, there's, there's a view, just in, there's lots of things in the background. You can see Lake Union, Queen Anne Hill. You can, on the top of Queen Anne, there's Queen Anne High School. But right smack in the middle of downtown, can anybody find the Rainier Club? Rainier Club's right in the middle, and then just behind it is the Methodist Church, and then way over in the upper right is St. James, before its dome fell in. Um, so this uh, is a year before it opened, and the really neat thing is keep your eye, you, you got your eyes on the Rainier Club, the brick building right in the middle? Take a look at it today. There's the Rainier Club, but where's everything else? It's fascinating how we've grown. Okay, this, uh, you all know, what bridge is this? The Aurora Bridge, but well, what's the real name of it? George Washington Memorial Bridge, very good. And uh, this is a boat uh, that uh, is called the Mahong Monongahela, and it's escaping from Lake Union, uh, because if, if it doesn't escape before the bridge is completed, and then it won't get out unless you have to take the masts down. It had four masts, it was built in 1882 in Glasgow, and it went to a variety of places and it sold in bankruptcy for $8,600, converted to a barge in Vancouver, BC. Now, here's what it looks like today. And this is looking north beneath the Aurora Bridge, but I want to tell a little bit of a story about the bridge itself. We know about bridges in West Seattle, right? So, uh, anybody know what this is? It's a key, but it's a very special one. This is called the Taft Key. William Howard Taft, president, um, he used this key in 1909 to open our first World's Fair, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And this was uh, a key that was created by George Carmack, who discovered the first gold in the Yukon. And so there are 22 solid gold nuggets there uh, attached to Alaskan marble. And seven presidents used it to open various things. Well, we fast forward, oop, how come we're blank? There we go. That is what? The Aurora Bridge. Now this is February 22, 1932. This is the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birth. And big crowds were there, but they weren't on the bridge beforehand, they were on either side. And Governor Roland Hartley who didn't want the bridge to be built to begin with. He, he was from Everett, <laughs> and he, he, he wasn't a fa in favor of this, but he was this main speaker, and he was bragging about how this bridge was great, intended to speak long. And way back in Washington, D.C., the president, Herbert Hoover, had his finger waiting to hit the key on the Taft key, and at 2.57 p.m., didn't matter what was happening out here in Seattle, he hit the key. And Governor Hartley wasn't done. He was bloviating, but he, but he hit the key, the fireboats, flumes went up, um, the flags unfurled, and people went out onto the bridge, and he never finished his speech. <laughs> so this key has a, a, you know, this is the same view. Take a look at this again. This is looking north. On, imagine, this is my favorite photo in the book. I mean, just look at it. Talk about a group hug. <laughs> It's just fantastic to see all these people on the bridge. Well, this is the bridge today, and this is a good example of the heroics that Gene Sherrard goes through. If you were to try to shoot this photo today from the exact vantage point, you couldn't do it, unless you had a chainsaw to cut down the trees. What Gene has instead is he has a, a 21-foot 21 21 extension pole that he hoists up so that he can get at the right angle and puts his heavy Nikon on top. I don't know how he does it, but he got this photo. Now, here's Hubert Ho Herbert Hoover pressing the calf key to open the bridge, right? Who's this? What do you think he's opening? 
World's Fair. The World's Fair here. And we cover the World's Fair in the book. This is one of the favorite spreads that we have. This is Paula Dahl. She's six years old, and she was lucky enough near the end of the fair to become the nine millionth visitor. And you can see she got a big stuffed purple dog, and she got a bright purple sign, a yellow sign that said uh, nine million. And they're her happy parents, and there's her very unhappy sister behind her. <laughs> Today she teaches elementary school in Issaquah at Sunset Elementary, and she has saved her nine million sign. And she's posing there with her kids. The Great Seattle Fire I mentioned. There are very few photos of the actual fire because most photographers were downtown and they were trying to save their equipment. They weren't shooting the fire. But this is one of the few. There's only a dozen photos like this. And in, on June 2nd, to commemorate the Great Seattle Fire, you'll see in the paper uh, now and then on this, with this photo. Um, all of the buildings that you're seeing in this photo were destroyed. 30 blocks of Seattle were destroyed. And this was on June 6th of 1889. Um, and Seattle really wanted to rebuild quickly. And today you can see bricks and stone were the way to go. Now, here is just a day or so after the fire. The newspapers called this the hideous remains. Imagine 30 square blocks, poof, going up. It's all wood. This is what left, was left of the Occidental Hotel. And uh, it was blown up. A, a, a day later. So this was a, this is a rare photo of what was left. It was on the Flatiron Block and where Yesler Way is. And here's here's a way for you to understand where it is. Do you see the Pioneer Building? And then way over on the right, what's sticking up in the, today, the sinking ship garage we call it. It's uh, between First and James on Yesler Way. And this photo from a slightly different angle is looking east. This is the Seattle Hotel, a grand hotel on that Flatiron Block. And that was there until 1961, when it was torn down. And what went into its place? And keep in mind, this is, photo was taken in 1908, so there's no Smith Tower yet. Go to today, there's the Smith Tower, but what's in the place of the hotel? The sinking ship garage. Uh, really a de debacle if you, if you like old buildings. And one person who was really angry about this was Victor Steinbrook. And he said, we're not going to take this anymore. And we are going to save what? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> I, 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 we'll get to that. But I just want to point out, this is a fun thing. Look at the windows at the top of the building, the Merchant's Cafe building across. Um, the developers of the sinking ship garage said they were going to be very sensitive to development by <laughs> replicating the basket handle windows. And so you can see that on top of the garage there. All right, this is the Pike Place Market soon after it opened in 1907. And in 1971, some of you may not know, this was in big threat. This is today. Uh, we would not have the Pike Place Market without Victor Steinbrook and thousands of other people arising to say, look, this is the heart of Seattle. We need this. Anybody have a guess as to where this is? It's not in West Seattle. Queen Anne? Not in Queen Anne. This is Melrose Avenue on Capitol Hill. And here's how you can tell where it is. This was taken in 1955, and something happened pretty quickly after that. I-5. <laughs> Isn't this magical to go back and forth in history like this? You know, this, this now and then concept is pretty cool. How many of you remember going to the post office when it had columns and steps? downtown at 3rd and Union. Uh, these, the, the concrete was made out of chuckanut sandstone. The problem with it was that it was spongy and it absorbed dirt and soot and, I'm glad we're done eating, pigeon poop. <laughs> and it could not be cleaned off. And so they decided, in their wisdom, to uh, rebuild. And uh, one critic calls what we have today uh, a file cabinet turned on its side. <laughs> There are people here who know what this is. What is this? Hooverville. This is taken in the mid-30s. There were 500 shanties down there, south of downtown. Now, of course, you can see the Smith Tower. Um, and then today, watch the Smith Tower. There it is. This is taken on top of a Port of Seattle crane. Gene has to persuade uh, a lot of people to help him out to get to the right vantage point. Um, 
streetcars. We love streetcars in Seattle. The junction is named after a streetcar crossing. This is Fremont and a streetcar uh, one year before all the streetcars were gone. And this is 1940. Now, um, I'm going to give you fair warning. You may want to close your eyes on the next slide, but here is Fremont today. <laughs> Gene, in his presentations, uh, says this is a... Uh, uh, Instead of a streetcar, we have two women walking abreast. <laughs> In the International District, uh, this is 1921, this is the Go Hing celebration. And Go Hing means pleased to meet you. But the cool thing about this photo is that all the buildings are still there. That's one of the cool things about now and then is when something is still there and, and, and your, your hairs kind of go up on the back of your neck. And here it is today with Sifu John Leong in the front uh, middle. He's 80 years old and all of the lion, uh, they, they got him out on the street uh, and blocked off the street and Gene was asking, uh, there, there was a West Seattle cop there, he's posing there in the middle too, just to the right, and he says, are we gonna get in trouble? He says, no, no worries, and so he took the photo. Now, here's another little puzzle. This is something that doesn't exist. What is this? It's a river, but what river? It's not the Duwamish. It doesn't exist anymore, John. This is what's called the Black River. This was at the south end of Lake Washington. And this is a flotilla of, of pleasure boats out in 1906. This photo was in the Seattle PI then. And the river ran from the south end of the lake to the Cedar River, and then the Duwamish and into Elliott Bay. But in 1916, this river dried up. Why did it dry up? In one fell swoop. The lake went down nine feet of water level in the lake. What happened in 102 years ago? The locks. The locks, very good. And also, uh, many of the Duwamish tribal members who lived along this river lost their home. Another, uh, this is what it is today, another ironic shot. <laughs> Brown Bear Car Wash and McDonald's. Um, this is on Lake Union. We're looking east, and you may think, oh, that's the lake. I know where the lake is. But all of this is filled in. That trestle that you see <laughs> over there is West Lake Avenue. Not East Lake, West Lake. And here it is today, boarded up and graffitied. OK, we're getting closer to the end. Everybody knows this. How many here rode on the Kalakla? Ooh, that's a fair number. That's about 20, 25 people. I rode on the Kalakla on the last month that it ran on the Seattle to Bremerton run. I was in, I was uh, sophomore in high school in my high school stage band. It was in June of 67, and we were fortunate to go over to Bremerton to the uh, Olympic College Stage Band Festival, and Quincy Jones was the guest star there. And we rode on the Kalakala, and I remember so well the place was, there were spider webs everywhere on it because it was about to be shut down, and you couldn't go to the upper floors. And when the motor turned on, it, it shook you. I mean, you could hear the walls going, This is the Kalakala. Where is it? It's in the locks. And uh, it was built in 1935. It was called the Flying Bird or the Silver Slug, depending on what you wanted to call it. <laughs> it was the world's first streamlined ferry. There was only one of them. And this is in 1947 when it was going through the locks. Some of you may know, and, and take particular notice at the top. I mean, you see the big round windows on the bottom. But at the top, that's the wheelhouse. Just keep that in your brain for a sec. And it went to Alaska to be a crab plant. It went back to Seattle. There's attempts to save it. Weren't enough, wasn't enough money. Um, went to Tacoma in 2015, and it was scrapped. Well, Gene wanted to replicate this, so he went to the locks, and he tried to figure out when was there a time something so big was going through. And so he got a battleship <laughs> with a tugboat, and this is the Turner Joy. And that may ring a bell for a few of you, because that was one of the two ships down in the Gulf of Tonkin in 1964 that got us into the Vietnam War. So, any of you know where this is? This is down at Salty's. Very good. This is the wheelhouse I was pointing out to you. It's very sad, but on the very last day before they parted this thing out and destroyed it. Jerry King and of Salties went down and bought a couple pieces of it. He bought this, 
and he bought the, the drivetrain, and you can go to their parking lot day or night, anytime, and see it. Um, he calls it public art. It's, it, you know, it's, it's what we've got left. And then this is the view from the inside if you look out to downtown. Okay? What is this? How many in here are, are shedding tears for the loss of the viaduct? I know the tunnel's fast, but, you know, I, I, I understand the noise, the grime, blah, 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 and, and, but there is nothing like the view you had from the viaduct. I mean, it was for rich or poor, it was the best lay of the land view in Seattle. This is in 1953, just before they let cars on it, and, oh, and it opened up. And Gene is very proud that, to repeat this. You can see the Smith Tower in this next one, but he got a red car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're coming closer to home. Anybody here on the Admiral Theater's opening night? I was just a glimmer in somebody's eye. Rico, I can't believe you. <laughs> Weekend in Havana was the big opening night show at the Admiral Theater in 1942. And many of you may not know that the lobby of the Admiral Theater is what was called the Portola. And it operated since 1919. So, guess what? We are in the 100th anniversary year of the Admiral Theater. You walk into that lobby, it's been there 100 years. And I was so proud to be a part of the effort to save this thing. In fact, we learned about it two nights before the closing night in a little teeny ad in the Seattle Times that said closing night Sunday and we organized a picket. We got 50 people there including all three of our state legislative representatives. We got Greg Nichols there who was our county councilman at the time and uh, you can see Sharon Nichols on the left and their, their son in the middle. Greg is in the back right and Georgette Valley, our state rep. And we, I mean, gee, we had four TV stations there covering it. Cairo did it live. This was, I mean, the beautiful part was the closing night movie on the marquee. Dirty, rotten scoundrels. <laughs> what could be better than that? And we didn't, you know, I was one month into being president of the Historical Society. It's an all-volunteer group that's been started uh, five years before. We didn't know a thing about landmarking, but we got up to speed very quickly. And within six months, we got the place landmarked. We packed public meetings. We, some of you may have a Save the Admiral button. We sold 1,300 of those. Before the internet, we got 4,000 petition signatures. And today, the theater stands, and here is the now. You might remember, this is 2016, where we had 900 school kids from, from Lafayette and Al Alki and Schmitz Park all walking there to demonstrate support for the renovation of the theater that now makes it four screens without harming any of the historic aspects of the building. And it wouldn't have happened without the groundswell of support from West Seattle. I always say about uh, landmarking, um, you know, you, you can't save everything. You don't want to save everything. But you've got to save the good stuff. So the question is, what is the good stuff? And then you go all out to save it. And we've done several things as a historical society to do that, including the two crown jewels of the junction. Now, who knows what this is? We're still in West Seattle. Who's old house? Anger's old house? I love it. He's right there on the right hand side. You remember when this was built in 1864, John? No, I'm afraid This is the oldest house in Seattle still standing still standing. This photo is from the 1890s, but it was built in about 1864 by Doc Maynard, who traded land in Pioneer Square to come over here to Alki Point. Alki, some of you know how to pronounce Alki. And then it, it was moved inland. Well, here's the house, and, and this is, whose house was it? Um, it was Ivor Hagelin's house. His mother is in white on the doorstep, and his grandmother is next to her. This is the house, I, I, I want to say it's today, we posed some people from the Historical Society there a couple of years ago, but this is another case of a now being a then, because the house is still there, but they have made the front of it a whole lot more nice. And there is a uh, plaque that indicates that this is the old house, but it's not on the house or on in front of the house, but this is on 64th Avenue 
on Alki, but if you go to 64th and Alki and look straight down in the sidewalk, you'll see the plaque. And you can see also that the right north part of the house has been chopped off, but the rest of it is the original house. So that's something that we can acclaim to fame. And anybody know who this is? Angeline. Princess Angeline. Very good, Ron. This is uh, the first, they're the eldest daughter of Chief Seattle, for whom our city is named, Catherine Maynard, who was the second wife of Doc Maynard, renamed her Angeline. Her given name was Kiki So Blue. And this is where she lived, and it was a real puzzle. Imagine, what do you go through in your head to try to locate where a photo was taken. Some people thought this was along the waterfront, but based on the trees and the, 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 the stump in the foreground and the house and some photos and maps, we have a volunteer named Ron Edge who works with us. He's a volunteer at Mohai. Um, and he was able to triangulate and locate where this was. And so we've shot this with Ron in the photo this is the only real green area, and it's a very tiny green area, off Western Avenue, just below Pike Place Market. And you can't get to it. This is a little misleading because it's fenced off, but Gene is inside the fence to shoot this little uh, area of bamboo. But if you go to Lowell's in the market, anybody been to Lowell's restaurant? Go up to the second floor, go have lunch or whatever, go to the second floor, look straight down the window, and you can see this, and that's where Princess Angeline lived. And she was born in 1820 and she died in 1896. And she spent a lot of her time on the streets of Seattle. Uh, she took in laundry, she sold handmade baskets, she posed for photos and got paid for that. And this is one of the more famous photos. And she's sitting on what we now know as Post Alley and what's in the background is First Avenue. And we've inset Chief Seattle, her dad there, for a very good reason. Because in taking the now, we got some magic. This is two people who are royalty. This is on the left, Mary Lou Slaughter, who lives over in Kitsap County. She's the great, 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 great granddaughter of Kiki So Blue. And sitting next to her, kneeling next to her, is Ken Workman, who now lives in North Bend, but he grew up in Delridge, and he is the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. And the cedar wear that they are wearing, Mary Lou makes. Now, when we were shooting this photo, that's Gene shooting the photo, and I'm shooting the photo with Gene shooting the photo. <laughs> And some of them we did with a hat and some not, but we took the hat off because it created a bad shadow. But while we were shooting the photo, Ken thought he was feeling something and he kept turning around. And he came up to Gene and me after the shoot, you know, about five minutes later, and he said, you know, somebody was bumping into me. And Gene and I looked at each other and we said, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. There wasn't anybody even close to you, behind you. And he said, no, no. Somebody was tapping me on the elbow. And he thinks it's one of his ancestors talking to him. And Gene also says that that's kind of what happens when he gets a now photo location. And he, it's like clicking in. It's the nudge of history where you know you're at the exact spot where a photographer stood to shoot the older photo. Well, that's the end of the show. This is the back of the book. Um, there are incredible uh, blurbs, uh, people, civic leaders all over Seattle have endorsed this book. And that's Paul Dorpat standing on the sundial at Gasworks Park with the city behind him. He lives in Wallingford. And I'm just really honored to be able to be a part of this project and to present it to you. It's, to me, it's an exciting project because anybody can relate to it, whether you're a long timer or a newcomer. And it's all about getting, uh, Meredith was saying, we, we were talking about a sense of community. You know, it's not, it's not a physical thing you can grab onto or count or put on a ledger sheet, but it's there. 
And this is the kind of thing that builds community. And if you feel embedded, even the so-called new people, the Amazonians, the, the, the tech industry, the people who are flooding into town, there's some in this audience perhaps. Everybody, doesn't matter new or long time, you have, we all have a yearning to be connected to each other, to our community, and if you are connected to your community, you, you're a better citizen, and I just think you're a better, you're a happier person. I mean, that's what we all look for, and so I'm, I'm really grateful to have uh, been able to do a small part with this book. To, I, I was the editor of the book, I wrote the introduction of it, and, and uh, it's, it's, you know, it's just one way to contribute, just like all the rest of you do in this room. It does, somebody was right when she said this, it takes a village, right? <laughs> So thank you very much. I'll take any questions if you have any. I know you've got to get on with your, the rest of your business. You've been a great audience. Yes? Correct. Uh, you, the question is, the, the first ferry on the Sound, I'll make this really quick. The first ferry on the Sound, was, uh, its maiden run was December 24th, Christmas Eve of 1888. And it went from downtown, in fact it was in the photo of the downtown, the Gold Rush downtown photo. And it went to the foot of Ferry Avenue, roughly where the water taxi is now. It's a little bit north and when the tide is low you can see the piling still there. The ferry that I showed you was the city of Seattle, and it ran until uh, the 20s, and it was five cents to take that ferry. And they, it was a lure to get people from downtown over here because the Admiral area was nothing but trees. And there was a free cable car that ran up Ferry Avenue and around the Admiral area and toured you so that you could see land and be enticed to buy a lot for $200. Thank you very much. Afterwards, I'll be over here if you want to buy a copy of the book. I'm happy to get to So, so a couple things. So, that was great. That's about community. That's about the people in this room. It's about the work we do. So, a really big hand for Clay. One more time. Thank you.